from his homeland of Macedonia across the Greek mainland, through Asia Minor, taking Syria and Egypt, capturing the ancient city of Babylon and the lands of Persia, slowly but surely enduring through the Sogdian and Bactrian territories. Alexander had conquered the Persian Empire and much of the known world. Now he stood with his elite army staring down into the Indus Valley. Alexander wanted to do what no Greek had done since Hercules. Make war with the elephant kings of India. This is the final episode of Alexander's campaign. And it is here he faces his biggest challenge, a foe that has never been encountered. Will his legacy endure or will he fall at the final hurdle? Hello and welcome to Antiquity in Question. This is the third episode of the AIQ podcast. My name is Alexander Goodman and today we'll be talking about Alexander the Great. Was he really great? We'll be going to be looking at military, politics and social history to see if he really deserved this grand title. So some of you may be wondering who is Alexander the Great and before we get into that first of all we need to talk about his father Philip II because it may be that he is a pivotal point at why Alexander who was who he was and achieved what he did. So Philip II was king of Macedonia between 359 BC and 336 BC where he managed to take a very deprived and unimportant state of Macedonia and become one of the most important uh, factions inside the Greek peninsula. So effectively what he did was manage to conquer large parts of Greece and bring them under Macedonian influence and control. One of the major things that Philip II does is he reforms his military and what he does is he creates a standing, uh, standing professional army which is uncommon at this time. It has been seen before with Thebes but it is very uncommon and what he also does is he replaces the traditional hoplite system of uh, fighting which the Greeks have adopted and used for a very long time and replaces them with something called Sarissa Pikeman and uh, what that effectively is is a, it's called a Sarissa Pike and it's a 13 foot long spear effectively and it is absolutely incredible against hoplites. The main difference between the Sarissa pikemen and the hoplites, therefore, was, as I mentioned, the size of the spear. It was vastly uh, larger and therefore a lot more uh, usable because there's more reach. Uh, there's a less chance of you getting hit and more chance of you injuring your foe. Uh, the Sarissa pikemen also had a smaller shield, which meant they were more uh, maneuverable. And they also had lighter armor, which meant they were more uh, flexible and maneuverable as well. So they definitely had an advantage in some descriptions than over the hoplites which as we see through history they absolutely devastated hoplites and were a lot more better um, in military when they're up against a hoplite phalanx. So this military reform alongside the already well established skills of the Macedonian army which I mean by that I mean the companion cavalry they have the notorious cavalry and they also had very good Peltas, which is a javelin sort of type of unit. Um, those all brought together is probably the main reasons why Greece fell to uh, Macedonia and why Philip was able to conquer them in the end. This is probably the most important factor which accumulated into propelling Alexander into his achievements and what he was able to do. This was the basing that he managed to use to effectively do what he did. This conquest therefore managed to make security for Alexander and a very hostile area of Greece stable for some time, which meant Alexander could propel himself fully and utterly into this campaign without a worry of uh, the Greek city-states becoming a problem. So as I said, in 336, Philip II is no longer the king of Macedonia. He got murdered by one of his bodyguards, Pausanias. So after this happened, there was a bit of a succession crisis. But Alexander managed to come to the throne of Macedonia to become Alexander III of Macedonia. He then decided to change his attention to no longer Greece because that had now been subdued, but he went towards Illyria and Thrace to more tribal regions to try and suppress them as they were harassing Macedonia. However, 
during these campaigns, news spread that apparently Alexander had died, and a city-state in Greece called Thebes, which is probably at this time one of the strongest city-states there is, decided to revolt because they no longer wanted Macedonian influence inside their city. However, the death rumours were not true, and Alexander had heard wind of this re revolt. He quickly marched down to Thebes, defeated their army, and completely razed the city to the ground. The city of Thebes was no more, and with this, Greece was now secured again. This now meant Alexander could turn his attention to the bigger threat, the Persian Empire. Alexander now, in 334 BC, decides to cross into Asia Minor, the first territory owned by the Persian Empire. Now this crossing was quite important because it was a large scale army crossing. There was 48,100 soldiers crossing. Of that, 6,100 were cavalry and there was 120 ships. It had seemed as soon as he crossed into Asia Minor that the war was brought right in front of him, where the satrap of Asia Minor, on behalf of Darius III, the king of the Persian Empire, had brought his army to a river crossing waiting to engage with Alexander. Now, this is quite important because Alexander had a lot of trusted advisers from Philip around him. One of them was Parmenion, who advised Alexander to go further upstream to an easier crossing, to cross it and then wait a day until the attack happened. However, Alexander completely ignored him, crossed the river exactly where they were and charged straight into the Persian army. Now, this would seem crazy and ridiculous to any commander but Alexander did it nonetheless and he managed to rout the Persian army quite considerably winning his first engagement and setting himself a foothold in Asia Minor to propel himself even further and deeper into Persian lands. With his victory at the Battle of Granicus, Alexander now went around the local populace of Asia Minor to settle them, subdue them and establish his authority. He eventually made his way to a town called Halicarnassus, where he managed to win the siege, subdue that populace, and then take the region of Caria, which is quite important. He has now established a well-defined foothold in Asia Minor. He carries on going through Asia Minor, going up north to take more places, get his authority established, and he marches on Syria, where he prepares himself for his second engagement, but this time against Darius II himself, the king of the Persian Empire, at the Battle of Issus. Alexander arrives at Issus, heavily outnumbered, potentially outmatched. There is no logical way you could see Alexander winning. However, he defeats Darius III, who retreats far into his empire. This leaves Syria and Egypt open for Alexander, who relishes at the idea. He marches immediately down to Tyre, an impregnable city, manages to take it with some amazing feats of engineering and tactical skill. We'll discuss that more later. He marches down to Egypt, subdues the population, establishes his authority, and again has another amazing siege by taking out the well-established city of Gaza. At this point, he has con taken control of nearly half of the Persian Empire. He is doing an incredible job, however, this is not enough, where he continues his march on to Gorgamela, where Darius III is waiting to make his last and final stand of the Persian Empire. So, in 331 BC, the Battle of Gorgamela starts. Alexander is up against an even more dangerous foe than he had at the Battle of Issus and Granicus. Here, he's outnumbered 3 to 1 against a humongous army. He managed to pull off an insane victory, which was potentially Alexander at the best we've ever seen. It was utterly amazing the, what he managed to do at this battle. We'll talk about this more later and you can really get to grips with it. However, this effectively left Darius III hopeless. Alexander had now gained access to the rest of his empire, so Darius again retreated in the hope of forming another army to face him one more time. Following the victory of Gorgamela, Alexander marches down to Babylon, taking one of the most important cities inside the Persian Empire, the ancient capital, Babylon. 
He then carries on his campaign, taking the cities of Susa, Persepolis and Ecbatana, the three capitals, current capitals of the Persian Empire. And what's important here is this is where Alexander finds the wealth and luxury of the Persian Empire. He takes the treasury. Just in the bedroom of Darius himself in Persepolis, Alexander finds 5,000 talents of silver in his bedroom. This is 10 times the amount of money Athens would be able to make in a year. This is an incredible amount of money, which is only going to make Alexander stronger. And by taking Susa, Persepolis and Ecbatana, Alexander had now conquered all of the Persian Empire, par Sogdia and Bactria, which will prove to maybe be some of the hardest campaigning he does. It is around this time that Darius III had retreated into Parthia and got betrayed by his own men. He was trying to form another army in the hope of defeating Alexander. However, his men decided to eliminate him, murdering him um, and taking control of his authority. This meant Alexander now was in key position to, to establish his authority over the whole of the empire. He had no real opposition. He had an elite force in the centre of the Persian Empire ready to spread out whenever he needed it to. However, instead he moved into Bactria and Sogdia because Bessus, the satrap of Bactria, had started a guerrilla campaign against Alexander, something which was a long and gruelling process for Alexander to deal with. He had not seen guerrilla-style tactics since he'd fought the tribal lands of Thrace and Illyria before he'd even started his Persian campaign. This took five years for Alexander to deal with and eventually he managed to take over Sogdia and Bactria by taking some key settlements. The Sogdian Rock and Bactra. It is at this point that Alexander has now captured and has control over the whole of the Persian Empire. For most men, this would be far enough. He's already gone on a gruelling campaign to take the biggest and most well-developed empire there is in the world. But Alexander was not done. He turned his head towards India, the place of mystery, the place no one, no Greek, apart from Hercules, has been before. He wanted to make history. He wanted to make his legacy. So Alexander moves down into India, goes along new territories and new environments you haven't seen before, tropical ju jungles where it is horrendously hot but also has torrential rainfall, something his army becomes quite unsettled with, with these new and, uh, their, you say, sort of barbaric sort of environments, for them at least, well of course it's not barbaric now, but they would think this is horrendous and awful and would really actually affect affect the army. So he comes against one uh, local lord, as say, it wasn't such as a lord, but it effectively was uh, another uh, sort of independent king called Porus. Porus territory was around about half of the Punjab area, and he was quite a considerable foe to come up against compared to Alexander, but Alexander clearly at this point was powerful enough to face the likes of the Indian kings. However, it's important to recognise here that Porus is one of the smallest Indian kings there are. However, he was still a threat to Alexander, so Alexander had to subdue him and to defeat him in battle if he was going to progress in his campaigns in India. So the two, the two armies met and it was a slight victory for Alexander, but a crucial victory. Inside this battle, Alexander himself was deeply wounded and he even had his horse killed under him. Alexander's life was almost taken during this battle, but it was vital for his victory. He had to win this and eventually he did manage to secure victory. He then decided to march on with his army. However, it had seemed that the, the weather and the opponents and the continuous battling all the way from the very start in Macedonia down into the Indus Valley. These campaigns were evidently too much for the army who decided to revolt against Alexander's authority, forcing him to march back to the, hopefully to the homeland of Macedonia. However, the route they took was a very surprising one for the army, which brought even more devastation and pain onto his men. 
So with this revolt, Alexander accepted that he cannot progress any further into India, but his ambition to explore new lands and to conquer more had not disappeared. So what he did was he marched his army through the Gedrosian Desert, a place where no one normally would go due to its arid and horrible conditions. And unfortunately, many of his men perished during this march as water was not easily accessible at all. So he eventually gets to Babylon and he decides to rest his men. He sends most of his veterans back home to Macedonia and starts to enlist more men in Macedonia to come and replace them as he was not done campaigning. During this time in Babylon where he was resting up, he decided to make plans for more invasions. Now two are the most important that come to mind. He plans for the invasion of Arabia, a peninsula that has rarely been invaded and could hold many luxurious goods and much wealth in this region. However, his most ambitious campaign is yet to be discussed, and that is his campaign against the Carthaginian Empire, a, a superpower in the Mediterranean towards the west, who's currently, well, who will soon be at war with the notorious Roman Empire. The Carthaginian Empire was a well-established empire with uh, naval superiority against most in the Mediterranean. This truly would have been a fascinating engagement between the two superpowers of the time. However, these plans were never enacted as Alexander, at the age of 32, contracted a fever and within days had lost his life. He'd left no successor to his empire. With his death, his empire was split up between the satraps he had already established, his advisers and his generals, who then fought over his land for the next few hundred years. So this was a brief overview of Alexander's campaigns. So can these accomplishments that we've just read off really be the hallmarks as to why Alexander was great? And do these accomplishments, if so, do these accomplishments mean he's deserving of being great? This is what we're now going to discuss. We're going to first of all move into the military side of Finns. And does all the battles we mentioned, the Battle of Issus, the Battle of Granicus, can these and are these the reasons he is great? So as I've just mentioned, one of the reasons why Alexander is thought to be the great uh, and has the title the great is because of his military achievements. So let's delve into that little, a little bit. So Alexander is evidently a really good general. He, um, he never loses battle during his whole campaign. And it's only potentially one engagement where the, the tides are sort of even. And there is a legitimate chance that he could win, you know, from the outset. And that is the Battle of Granicus, his very first one, which we, we will be discussing first. But it's important, though, we need to just establish this now, that he does have a few things going his way. So his army is far superior than any others. It is a standing army established by Philip II. It has Sarissa Pikeman, which is an unstoppable force um, at that point in time. And it was the very first time that many other people had also fought against this. So, like Alexander had never fought against an elephant before, all these other armies had never fought a Sarissa pipe before, you know, so we have to even up a little bit. They do have an advantage of some descriptions, but it is important, as I just said, to realise that every battle, apart from Granicus, when you look at it on paper, there is no way Alexander should win these battles. It is actually incredible that he comes away, not only just with like a Pyrrhic victory, which is a victory that has only slightly been won, but sometimes it is a decisive victory, which is absolutely insane. So Alexander goes into the Battle of Granicus um, with about an evenly matched army. Alexander has around about 40,000 men in his army. It's actually 37,100 to be exact. And he's up against a contested figure between about 20,000 to 40,000 Persian army. Now I need to say most of the Persian forces throughout his campaign is heavily contested. There is some estimated numbers from historical texts and there's some estimated numbers from um, a uh, kind of more contemporary texts and it's important to know that we don't truly know what's the most realistic however we're going to go with modern scholarship for most of these um, and they are much more limiting than the ancient ones but so 
Alexander is up against an amalgamation of the satraps of the Asia Minor. And there's about 10 different leaders joined into this coalition army who's part of the Persian Empire. And they have put all their money together and instead of fielding their own troops, they've got Greek mercenaries. So they're com compromised of about 50% is cavalry and 50% is Greek hoplites. And as I mentioned earlier, Sarissa pikemen have a big advantage over hoplites. So that's very important to remember. So going into this battle, I mentioned it earlier in the brief uh, brief overview, but one of the most important parts of this is how Alexander is as a character. And this is potentially why he wins the Battle of Granicus, which is the most even out of all the fights. So he gets an advisor called Parmenion, who advised him to go further upstream, cross the river, and then wait a day and engage the Persian Empire. Alexander ignores this, crosses a river where we are, where they were straight away, and then engages the Persian army straight away. He manages to smash the cavalry, rout them, and go into the hoplites, where, at this point, as we know, it's a very easy job for him, where the Sarissa pikemen easily outmatch the hoplites. So the result of this battle was that the Macedonians had very little losses, which is quite important. They only lost 400 men. And although this battle was not humongous and it only meant they could gain half of Asia Minor under Macedonian control, it's important when we discuss if Alexander was great or not because this is the first occasion we've seen him thinking outside of the box as a military commander. So he has Parmenion, who I said earlier gave him some advice. What's important to realise is Parmenion is really one of Philip's most trusted advisors. He is probably the most capable military commander on Alexander's campaign. And it's important that Alexander actually ignored his advice and thought of something that seemed utterly ridiculous to everyone else. The reason Parmenion is advising he does this alternative route is because this is what's been tried and trusted and worked uh, over time. And these are battle tactics that people know of. But Alexander can think on his feet and find different ways and different solutions to, f to fight and to have different tactics. And by him putting into place his own one, he managed to get the Persians off guard. And potentially, if he went with the Parminian example and uh, advice, yes, they still may have won, but would they have had as little losses? Would it have been such a uh, defined victory? You know, all these things need to play, be played into account. And it's Ale we have to put this battle down to Alexander shows his first capabilities of being an insane military commander. The next important battle is the Battle of Issus, where he fought Darius II for the very first time. And this is where you can see people start paying attention to Alexander. The first battle, yes, it was it was a battle, but it was off in Asia Minor. Darius, you know, he sent some satraps to deal with them. That didn't work. He could chuck more. You know, it didn't really matter. But this is the battle where Alexander starts turning heads and they start being seeing him as a problem and as a real threat. No one has defeated Darius in a pitch battle before, and Alexander does this. So Alexander goes into the into the battle with a few more men than he had in Granicus. He now has 40,000 men. However, the important thing is to look at Darius' army. So if we look at the ancient text, they say he has around about 250,000 men to 600,000 men. But modern scholarship is now arguing more to the 61,000 to the 108,000 men, which... I think is a much more realistic and we're going to run with this number. Now, although it's a lot smaller than the ancient number, what you still have to remember is that's massively outnumbering Alexander. Alexander is in a real disadvantage here. So another problem that Alexander faces not with not just the um, number disadvantage, but also the, the disadvantage of his terrain in the battle. So, as we mentioned earlier, we mentioned a lot about the Sarissa Pike and how it was new, it was inventive, and it was a massive advantage for the Macedonians. What we need to remember is their main and key aspect of their army, which is notorious, is their cavalry. Their cavalry was the best military aspect they had. The companion cavalry was potentially thought to be the best cavalry in 
the sort of Eastern Mediterranean world, and they were matched only by few, if matched at all. And how the Macedonian army would normally traditionally work is they would use a tactic called the hammer and anvil. And effectively, what that is, is you'd have a line of infantry, which is your anvil, and you'd have them engage with another set of infantry, or cavalry, or whatever, just a foe. And what the cavalry would do, they'd come back behind, and then they'd charge into the back of that foe, effectively pushing it onto the infantry line. So it's like a uh, blacksmith is smashing a hammer onto a bit of metal, onto an anvil. You're hitting it from the front and behind repeatedly. And this is the tactic that they would employ as as much as possible and what's important is in this battle Alexander can't do that because his cavalry is tied up for a long period of time during this battle and can't get behind the enemy so Alexander has to deploy new tactics and different ideas to how to defeat this Persian army so the opening moves of the battle was very similar on the Macedonian side and the Persian side. So they both lined their infantry up in the middle and then had two contingents of cavalry on either side. Now, what we have to remember is this was another river crossing battle where uh, Alexander had to cross a river to face the um, opposition. However, to start with, this is not the case because the Persians engaged their cavalry on both sides onto the Macedonians, which unfortunately for the Macedonians meant their major uh, advantage of their companion cavalry was gone. They were tied up. They couldn't get in the back of the Persians. So Alexander decided to move his infantry across the river and engage the, um, the Persians. And this was a risky move because although he managed to do it, he'd done it with heavy losses. And uh, it is noted by... Arian that 120 notable Macedonians died. So when we say notable, I believe he would he means by that people of rank, so officers. So I don't believe just 120 people died in the phalanx, but 120 officers died um, in the infantry engagement, which is a normally a crippling engagement. That is. That's devastating to the authority and command of an army, losing that many uh, officers. Alexander, at this moment, notices that the infantry are not doing a good job at holding and uh, attacking the Persian infantry. So what he does is he gathers some pelters, which I discussed, discussed earlier in the podcast. They're a javelin sort of unit. And he went with the javelin unit uh, on foot and punched a hole through the infantry line on the on the Persian left side of the infantry. And as he done that, he then managed with some Agrianians to um, dispatch of some Persian skirmishers, which was hindering Alexander's right flank of the cavalry to winning their engagement. This therefore meant the uh, cavalry won their engagement and Alexander now had some cavalry at his disposal. He then left the Pelters to continue fighting and got on a horse and got back with his cavalry unit. Then he got his cavalry unit and quickly marched through the punctured hole he left in the infantry line. Then at this moment, Alexander, as he does quite often, sees Darius and decides to leave the battle and just chase him. He wanted to capture Darius. If he gets, if he gets Darius, he gets the empire. Darius is a sole figurehead of this empire. So he does it, job's done, he's got it. But Darius flees, he can't catch him in the end. And he receives word from some of his men that his infantry line is about to break. If Alexander does not turn away and stops chasing Darius, he's going to lose this battle. So he turns around and he starts deploying his hammer and anvil tactics that are so common in Macedonian military history. And he starts smashing into the back of the Persian uh, infantry line. And this means he wins the battle. He manages to rout the rest of the Persian army and win the Battle of Issus. One of the most important battles of his campaign. This is where he showed his capabilities as a commander and as a military genius. He can make an impossible scenario where he's outnumbered, outmaneuvered, stuck in a battle which is losing. It's not in his favour. And just with a javelin unit, which is not notorious for this time period as being a really effective uh, winner of battles, he manages to change the tides of the war, uh, the tides of the battle, 
and use his cavalry, companion cavalries as the final piece. So with the conclusion of the Battle of Issus, um, what's clear to see is there was a huge Persian loss. The um, ancient texts say around about 20,000 men died from the Persian army. What we have to remember though, uh, we believe this is probably going to be inflated again. The ancient sources have really uh, over-exaggerated numbers, it appears. So that's going to be probably halved, maybe 10,000, 5,000 loss. But we are never never going to be sure, but we can guess that it is probably inflated. But what we've got to remember is that maybe doesn't sound a lot of men compared to what they put on the field. But for these time periods, that's a devastating loss. That's, you know, that could be a whole city has gone. Um, you know, that would actually have quite an effect on a region or a city or an area. That's a lot of men to lose. So this also was important because it gave access then into Syria and Egypt to very notorious places in the Persian Empire. Egypt was a very wealthy uh, area, mostly due to its agriculture. It was uh, booming with agriculture, with the, the effectiveness of the Nile, which is the river that runs in Egypt. And Syria was a big landmass as well, um, and held some key cities uh, like Gaza and Tyre, which we're going to talk about that he took. Um, so that was also important, but what's mostly important for the idea of, is Alexander great? Um is the idea that, again, like the previous battle, he's done stuff outside the box. He's used what he has to make a victory. And he's made a victory out of nothing. And I think this is the first point that you can start to argue that, yes, because of his military genius, he is the great. He's managing to devastate armies uh, in the most horrendous conditions for himself and his army. Um and Brit <laughs> remarkably, you know, winning them decisively, it doesn't actually make sense how he does this, but he does it. And this is the first example. And I would say from this army, you can start to see where you can argue he is great. So after this battle, he moves down to the city of Tyre. And this is the first important siege where Tyre is a small very small town. So Tyre is a Phoenician city, which basically means it's a city that was established by a group of people who are called the Phoenicians. They are the predecessors to the Carthaginians that I mentioned earlier. Um, a very naval orientated society um, and at their time, a very powerful society. But this city is actually split into two so you have Tyre that's on the land and then you have a little island just off the sea which has the rest of the city on it and that city is extremely fortified and prior to Alexander only Cyrus the Great actually successfully won a siege and there are two other people who has sieged the city they are Shalmaneser V and Nebuchadnezzar the second of Babylon so these two uh, kings sieged the city However, none of them actually successfully win or capture the city. Nebuchadnezzar eventually manages to get Tyre to pay tribute to them, uh, to him, and effectively gains their loyalty that way. But that's after a very, very long siege. And Shalmaneser has, again, a very long siege, but is not successful in the end. He doesn't get any tribute. He doesn't win the siege. He doesn't get them on their side. He just abandons it after a very long siege. So the fact that Alexander actually captures it and breaks into the city is extraordinary. Only, as I said, only Cyrus the Great had a successful siege at this place. So the reason why he managed to capture it and, and potentially one of the most um, notorious examples as to why he's such a military genius is how he how he captured it and because it was an island he attempted to put rocks into the sea to make a effectively a bridge he tried to create land to get siege towers to it however it was evident that this wasn't going to work and their defenses were far too good so what he did was he took siege equipment and he put them on boats and he sailed the boats outside the city and bombarded the city with his siege equipment eventually managing to break down the walls and he managed to capture it that way what's also important is that this siege although not like the others didn't take a vast amount of time 
what it did do was it took him seven months. And although that doesn't sound like a lot of time, what that does mean in this campaign is that he gave Darius seven months to be able to reconsolidate himself and regrow his army. The longer he waited at Tyre, the stronger Darius got, and he knew that. But he had the resilience and he had the confidence to wait there, see this siege out, and then capture it. He could have marched on. Yes, yes, he had the problem that uh, Tyre was a naval base and potentially meant Persia could use it as an opportunity to um, cause trouble and cause chaos inside of the areas that he, Alexander already uh, gained. But he decided to stay instead and deal with it. And that is quite, um, I think, quite an important factor. Uh, he evidently got quite annoyed by this, also waiting out there for seven months, because when he captured the city, he crucified 2,000 of its c civilians on the beach. Um, and as I said about the naval superiority of Tyre, um, what this effectively did was it ended it. And, per and he had now secured... He well, not yet, but he had managed to um, weaken uh, Persia's clutches on the Mediterranean, and it meant Alexander could now, you know, supply food to his army a lot more easier through the Mediterranean. And it was a really, really important that he did take Tyre in the end. So after the siege of Tyre, the next notable thing to argue about him, Alexander being the great and deserving of the title of the great is probably the battle of gorgamela uh, we mentioned earlier how it was the last and final battle he had against darius the third and um it's important to note before we talk about what happened in the battle that this is potentially the most outnumbered and outmatched alexander has ever been so far so alexander brings forty-seven thousand men to the battle and if we go with the ancient sources, which is crazy, <laughs> the Persian Empire has between 250,000 men to a million men at this battle. Now, modern scholarship has really slated this and debated this, and it's thought to be around about 90,000 to 120,000. However, although that is vastly lower than the ancient text, what you've still got to remember is that's almost double what Alexander has. And that's from the ancient text. The ancient text says he has 47,000. This is, this could be catastrophic for Alexander. He is marching, it looks and appears like he is marching into death. Darius must win this. There's no way Alexander can win this. If he does win this, this is probably deserving of the great. Because this is an incredible battle that he's going to fight. And it's going to be one which is going to have a lot of tactical manoeuvres. And it's one that's going to have excellence from both sides. Alexander sets up his battle deployment a little bit differently from what you would think is traditional in the Hellenistic period. So instead of having infantry in the middle and then cavalry on both sides, what he does is he, he changes it. He has infantry in the middle on his left with Parmenion as the commander. He has mostly infantry with some cavalry inside to give it a dynamic um, feel. And on the right, he's got mostly cavalry with some infantry hidden in there as well. So his army is quite flexible right now and quite dynamic and can change depending on how the battle changes on the persian side they've got two big rigid lines one full of infantry and the and then the one that's closest to alexander is a mixture of cavalry and inf infantry intertwined between each other the battle starts by alexander and he's uh, who has a small component of uh, companion cavalry in the center of his army he comes out in front of his army to trick uh, darius the third and who sends cavalry to follow him. So he comes out into the centre, Alexander, and then he shifts all the way to the right side of his army, uh, quickly moving his cavalry to force the other cavalry to come with him. So by Alexander moving his cavalry from the centre to the right, he manages to bait uh, the Persian cavalry to do the same, and they were in the command of Bessus. So he meets up with uh, so Alexander meets up with his cavalry on the right, and then they absolutely leg it all the way out of the battlefield. They've gone, as Arian says, they've gone past the cleared land for the battlefield, and they go off so far off into the distance. So what he effectively does is he makes the 
numbers of the Persian cavalry um, nullified because he takes them out of the battle where they can't be supported against the companion cavalry who are better. But as that ca- as that uh, conflict is going on, Alexander takes some cavalry, detaches himself, and then starts going towards the Persian line. And that's because Alexander went into this battle with a battle plan. And he thought that if he could take the, cav- the Persian cavalry to the right with the rest of his cavalry and then the persian engage the persians engage the macedonians on the left which they did do there will be a hole so alexander can get through and then as he detached himself he found the hole and it led straight to darius so just like the last battle he found darius he started chasing him and darius fled evidently of course you would flee um if darius dies the empire dies. He has to protect himself. So Alexander starts chasing Darius away from the battlefield once again. But just like before, he gets new. He gets some bad news, so he has to turn around. So by him effectively splitting the Persians in half, he found a hole. Well, unfortunately for Alexander, the same had happened to himself because he split his army in half. The Persians managed to find a hole themselves and some infantry and cavalry managed to exploit that and managed to go as far to the Macedonian camp and raid it. With the knowledge of this, that his left flank was again failing because they were very outnumbered and with his camp being raided, Alexander turned around and went against the Persian infantry from behind again doing the tactic of hammer and anvil and this uh, this the hammer and anvil tactic and the persian army noticing that they ca- their king darius iii had fled again dis- they decided to rout and this time there was no coming back so one of the important facts of this um battle is first of all how ludicrous the plan is it's everything has to play out immaculately for this to work and somehow Alexander gets it to play out perfectly. Um, what's interesting is you can see a real um, schism inside his camp about this idea. So you have advisors from the era of his father, Philip II. For instance, you have people such as Parmenion and Clitus who argue that this plan will not work. Um, it is ludicrous. Uh, and to be fair, it is ludicrous. Th- this shouldn't have worked. Um, but then you have Alexander's peers, so like Ptolemy, uh, Perdiccas, Python, other high officials, Cassander, high officials that um, really become great generals themselves, um, arguing that actually it may work because they have a lot of faith in Alexander. Alexander hasn't failed yet. Um, and evidently they had reason to believe in it because <laughs> he managed to do it. Somehow he managed to uh, to uh, defeat the army. So the Persians had heavy losses uh, from this battle, um, as seems to be a common trend when Alexander fights them. And it was also really important because it meant he gained access to the rest of the empire. This was the final nail in the coffin for Darius. Um he managed uh, after this as i mentioned he managed to take the city of babylon he managed to take the rest of persia uh he managed to take mesopotamia he took the basically he took the heartland the heartland of um the persian empire and at this point darius lost darius had darius had lost all authority and respect in his empire and eventually was assassinated by his own men so one of the one of the great quotes from this battle is that um, before the battle starts, Darius sends a peace treaty to Alexander, and then Alexander's court comes together and is discuss it, and <laughs> it's really funny. When the peace treaty arrived, Plutarch quotes that Parmenion uh, argues that Alexander, if he was Alexander, Alexander should accept the peace treaty, which then Alexander replied said, "That is true." I would if I was Parmenion. So he's effectively saying, yes, I understand that this is actually good, but I am better. I can win this and I can do more. Um, and you and that idea of there's a, a big divide in the camp between the old kind of Philip the second general uh, Philip the second generals and Alexander's generals is more evident here is uh, 
the, the, the idea and the capabilities of what they believe Alexander can do is different. The likes of Ptolemy and Python and the rest, Cassander, believe he can go on and do what Alexander achieves in the end. But with the likes that are loyal to Philip, th what they've already done is insane. It's amazing. They have not only defeated D Darius himself, but they've also defeated the satrap of Asia Minor. They've taken half of the Persian Empire. Well, just under half. They've done extremely well. And in their eyes, this may be a bridge too far. But it also it, it shows how Alexander just does stuff that shouldn't work. He should He should take this peace treaty. He shouldn't do this battle plan. But he does it. And it works, and it's effective, and it has catastrophic uh, results for the Persian Empire and for the Macedonian Empire because they just propel themselves to be even even larger. Um, Alexander does what Alexander wants, effectively. He does what he thinks is right. He he will listen to other people, as shown uh, with his army's revolt in India, but he will have to be forced to do it. He will not give up. So with the Battle of Gorgamela, uh, when we talk about the idea of um, Alexander being great and does he deserve it, uh, with this battle, I think this is actually the point where not only we say, yes, he probably does deserve the idea of great if we use it in a military idea, but I think also at the ancient period and the ancient time, this is when people start thinking Alexander is also the great. And I think you can see this before the battle and after the battle. So before the battle with the peace treaty sort of thing, the, the whole fact that Parmenion had said like, I would accept it if I were you. And then Alexander saying, well, I know you would, but I wouldn't because I'm not you effectively. Uh, what this symbolizes is that Parmenion, if he accepted, he would be become the title of, you know, something along the lines of Parmenion of Macedon, you know, it would it would be an achievement it, that would be um, recognised. And it would probably be enough for most men. But for Alexander, he realises he doesn't want that. He wants Alexander the Great. He wants that legacy. And so he's saying that if I say yes, I get this. If I say no and I beat it, which I believe I can, I will get better. And I'm better than every, like, other people because this is what I want and so the ambition is shown there and the drive to have a legacy is shown and I think um, that in a reason also just the idea of him doing whatever he can to get this legacy shows that he is also a great but then also at the end of the battle you know he's effectively completed in most Macedonians eyes the reason for the invasion of Persia it was to well, you could argue that it was either to um, get rid of Persian, uh, or Persia being a superpower and their influence and their control over other regions, but you could also argue that it was to conquer the Persian Empire. And by doing this, he effectively becomes the king of the Persian Empire, or the ruler of the Persian Empire. And just by doing that alone, I would say he has to be called the Great. His achievement of what he done by taking a small, minor, sort of minor, faction inside the Greek peninsula. At this, actually, uh, when he gets it from Philip, it, it's not that minor. But in the grand scheme of things, Macedon was not anything special. And then somehow he makes that and becomes the biggest empire there is. That surely must be enough to call him the great in an ancient perspective. So the last and final engagement we're going to talk about uh, for military reasons is why Alexander could be seen as a great um, is the Battle of the High Daspes, where it initially starts with some intricate manoeuvring over a river uh, where Porus the Younger, who is the son of Porus the Elder, who is the main Porus in the battle, um, has to jostle with Alexander. Eventually, Alexander defeats Porus the Younger and Porus the Younger dies. So we get to the main battle and effectively it starts with Alexander having his infantry in the line and then cavalry all on the right and then the uh, Porus' army, the Indian army, is uh, a full line of infantry with in front 
his war elephants, which Alexander had seen elephants at this point, but had never fought them in a, in a battle because uh, um, Darius III had a few in his entourage, but he hasn't fought them yet. And then he had on either, and then Porus on either flank of his army had cavalry. So what Alexander did the first move, he uh, split his cavalry in half on the right hand side and moved uh, half of it onto his left behind his infantry while he charged his own in, uh, own cavalry on the right hand side up into uh, da uh, Porus's his cavalry on the left. Porus hadn't seen the cavalry detachment moving around the army and so sent all of his cavalry on the left hand side to attack um, Alexander's uh, right hand side cavalry. Uh, so it's, what's interesting at this point is that Alexander uh, engaged his infantry as his cavalry was coming round the other side of the battle unchallenged uh, at all. The infantry hit the war elephants and the Indian infantry line as well. And Alexander took massive losses. His infantry was getting butchered against these elephants who were being used really well and tactfully against the infantry. However, Alexander's saving grace was that cavalry managed to come all the way round the back of uh, Porus's army and engage the um, cavalry from behind while the both of the cavalry were uh, caught up fighting, which meant Porus's army, uh, sorry, Porus's cavalry routed. Alexander then managed to get his cavalry to then engage the Indians. However, he first of all came up against elephants, which again was a struggle for him, where he almost died and his horse was killed under him, his beloved horse. Um, at this point, though, Alexander managed, uh, well, Alexander's army, he was actually more to, uh, gravely wounded. Um, Alexander's a army managed to rout the rest of Porus's uh, forces and win the battle. But what is important is that Alexander came extremely close to losing this battle. And it would have been catastrophic if he had died here. So why does this make the idea that Alexander is great? What happened at this battle? Which really presses that. Well, the, the river crossing that I, I talked about at the beginning is really incredible. So Alexander was doing feints and dummies and feints and crossing at the same time all along this river to confuse Porus the Younger and to get his men across. But what's fascinating is that just doing it on a normal river would be hard enough, but he crossed a monsoon river at the peak of monsoon um, season as well. This river was one of the most volatile rivers he could probably cross at this at this time of the month. And he managed to do it and then fight a battle and then win and kill the leader. That, that was incredible. Um, I think if you put any other general in that position who isn't Alexander, that wouldn't have happened. They would not have crossed it. He risked everything crossing that river, but he had everything to gain. And that's what makes him the great, Alexander the Great. He has an insane attitude when it comes to impossible tasks or impregnable fortresses. He does stuff that no one else would. Another really good uh, point about this was his cavalry manoeuvres. He uh, managed to hide half his cavalry around the whole of his army and then free it up to rout the rest of Porus's cavalry. Again, just showed his capabilities as a general. Alongside the problem of elephants, he'd never fought an elephant before. He'd never... And, and at, this, um, at this engagement, there was a mass of elephants. There was a... A lot of elephants for him to deal with, and they were doing devastating damage to his uh, army. But he managed to have the resilience to not worry about it, to continue his plan, continue the way that he was fighting, and stick to his guns. And that managed to get him to win the battle. Not only did he have the infantry almost rout, the cavalry being destroyed by cavalry, uh, sorry, elephants, he also had himself almost dying, but he managed to be strong enough to continue his battle plan and see it through. And then the other factor from this battle that shows that he was had the hallmarks of being great is the fact that this was the first time that anyone had gone as far as he did. So not only did he conquer the Persian Empire, but he need, he wanted to go further. He wanted that expansion, that conquest into new lands. And it just showed a different side of him. He's, 
thinking outside the box, that ambition, that drive, that is very, very rarely seen in history. There are, you know, some people in history, you can say like Caesar, Napoleon, such that. But Alexander for this time period was heads, head and shoulders above the rest. What he did was incredible. So it's pretty clear to see that militarily, yes, you can argue he probably can be called Alexander the Great because of his military achievements. However, we do need to look at the social political aspect of him as well. He had gathered this empire, he created this empire, but can he hold it? Does he put the infrastructure in there to make this empire long lasting? We're going to look at that because potentially, if he doesn't, but if he does that, does that then mean that potentially we can get rid of the idea of him being a great. If he captures something and gets it, if he can't hold it, is he really the great? Can he, if it just falls apart after a few years, is it is it really great? So let's have a look at what he puts in to stop that happening. So the first thing that we have to look at is actually his death. So when Alexander dies, as I mentioned earlier, he had no heirs. He didn't have a successor. He had a wife called Roxana, but she was still pregnant. They didn't know if it's going to be a boy. They didn't know if it's going to be a girl. They didn't know if it was even going to make it to childhood because, you know, at that stage, medicine wasn't as great. Uh, and so there was a potential for a miscarriage or loss of the child, you know, something unfortunate like that. So Alexander hasn't got a successor. He dies and all that there is supposedly is he has his will, which doesn't outline a successor, but he gives his signet ring to a guy called Perdiccas. And you'd think, oh, wonderful, great, that's his successor. And you could think that, but unfortunately no one else thought that. So a lot of his generals and officials like Ptolemy, like Seleucus, uh, like Cassander, like Perdiccas, they all fought over his empire and his empire schismed and broke up into lots of different sections like the Seleucid Empire, the, uh, the Ptole Ptolemaic Egypt, the Macedonian Empire. Uh, you had all different areas pop up and claim independence and have interfighting. And so, you know, he has no consolidation of his empire because he doesn't pick a, a successor. Does that hinder him becoming the great? Yes and no. Uh, we'll talk about it more later, but yes and no. Uh, something we've got to remember is Alexander was a great empire conqueror, but I argue he wasn't a great empire builder. And you can see by this point the fact that he adopted the satrapy model into his empire. That's not necessarily a negative, but what that did meant that he was the top of the state. He was the state. He was the absolute monarch. And then he had some people below him who would take care of regions, called satraps and then below them there would be power and he would delegate power but what that means is where does power really lie if he's at the top and he's absolute but he gives power to other people how does that structure come into it and then with his death is it easy then if he did have a successor let's say is it easy then to put that successor above all the satrapies and the satraps will that power shift be fine and i would argue no what you're doing is effectively if you're trying to make a hereditary monarchy which is a, a, a monarch who uh kind of the powers passed down for a bloodline or whoever you choose hereditary what you're doing by giving these other people uh, power, you're giving them an invitation to get inside that um, monarchy and that hereditary monarchy and be kind of usurp and take control. And so I argue that that's actually a negative for him. He hasn't established a well-defined structure for that empire to continue. Another thing that we need to talk about is his infrastructure as colony construction. So most of the infrastructure of the society is already there because his conquering place is already well established. So there's roads, there's temples, there's cities, there's there's already infrastructure there. And I would argue that he needs to then put in new stuff. He needs to put in uh, he needs to put in Greek and Macedonian influences inside cities. So gymnasiums. Uh, he needs to put in uh, temples. Make stuff that is more Macedonian and more Greek. But Unfortunately, it seems that he doesn't do that. And so instead, what he does is he just incorporates that into his own culture and his own court. And so instead of putting Macedonian culture and influence on places to be like, you are now part of my area, you're now part of the Macedonians, he's making a cosmopolitan, multicultural, cosmopolitan sort of 
infrastructure around there where you can go to different regions in his empire and you can see completely different things everywhere. So if I was in Egypt, I'd see very Egyptian style buildings and Persian style. And if I went to Greece, I'd see very Greek style. And if I went to Bactria, I'd see very Bactrian and Persian style. So nowhere in his empire has a coherent and similar aspect. They could all very independently they could all feel very independent and different cultures which effectively clash against each other eventually you can see this in alexander's own court so alexander progressively through time loses his macedonian touch he doesn't dress like a macedonian he doesn't act like a macedonian he develops persian ideas he marries roxana a bactrian uh, elite woman he he starts to change and that creates problems inside his court because the Macedonians don't see him as Macedonian anymore so they have inner fighting in his court uh, and you can also see this as, as a wider thing you start to have a, a amalgama uh, amalgamations of different cultures and different people becoming subgroups and there is no coherent band for people to obey or have authority from there's no culture that is superior and so inside his empire you have so much inner fighting and and instability caused by that and it's because Alexander's not putting down infrastructure to make people come together under one thing they don't necessarily have to all become Macedonians or become the same culture but they need to recognize a culture that is the Macedonian Empire because the Macedonian Empire is so many different cultures there's so much clashing in there and that then ties into the last bit about the social, uh, more the social aspect, and that is who is the citizens. So, on the Macedon so if you look at like the Roman Empire, for instance, the Roman Empire, you have citizens who can become Roman, and that's not just in uh, the Italian peninsula. That eventually spreads out, and people can become uh, citizens of Rome, and it gives them incentive, and they know then what is the authority. So Greece is in the Roman Empire. Greece is still Greece, but there's people in Greece who are Romans. That's how that works. But in the Alexander's Empire, you could be in Babylon, and you w could be a Macedonian, you could be a Persian, but it didn't make any difference because no... There was no citizenship. It wasn't you become a Macedonian, the Macedonians are the top. You can't become a Persian, pa Persians were the top. Everyone was fighting each other for this authority and this uh, kind of citizenship sort of idea. And it meant that there was no, there was nothing desirable for people to become. And so you just had this... And it could be positive, it could be a negative. I think it's more of a negative for Alexander and his empire, but you just had this group of people who were all the same, but they were different, and they didn't like each other for being different. And that caused instability. So I would argue Alexander does not establish a stable empire. He creates an empire, yes. He, he conquers land. He gets land, and it becomes the... Macedon Empire, but he does not create something that will last, um, and that's a massive downfalling for him. Yes, of course, he was not meant to die at 32. He never saw himself done. He literally thought he was a god. People proclaimed him as a god. He was a pharaoh. You know, he he was supposedly the son of gods himself um, with his lineage. He wouldn't have thought he would die at 32. No one probably would have thought he would die at 32, but he did. And he didn't do enough in that time period to make it uh, an empire last and work. And... But the question is then, because he didn't do any infrastructure or he did very little uh, socially and politically, does that does that mean he can't be the great? I would argue, if you took all his military achievements out and he inherited his empire and then did what he did, infrastructure, I argue he would not be called the great. He didn't achieve anything that was credible or amazing. It was purely his military um, genius and his victories that made him the great. So now let's look at the impact of his conquest as a whole. So uh, we've looked at the military, we've looked at social, political infrastructure. Now let's look at the impact and what this did and what his legacy led to. 
So it effectively started a new time period called the Hellenistic time period. We have abandoned now the classical Greek time period that we call call it and we're now into the Hellenistic time period and so what happens is after Alexander dies his empire is broken up into smaller kingdoms and empires so to name a few uh, the Seleucid Empire starts the uh, Ptolemaic Greek Empire starts you have uh, uh, independent Macedonia you have for a brief period of time you have the kingdom of Antigonus uh, you have the Marian Empire takes part of uh, the land in India uh, so it all breaks up and then different superpowers come out of that and then for a few hundred years until the Roman expansion into the east they play a big factor and these superpowers of the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid they're probably the two most common ones have to jostle with revolts and and each other and different powers and different problems and for a good 300 years Alexander has changed the course of history in this area. So Alexander also changes the social landscape of the Hellenistic era now, uh, where Alexander has effectively brought gr the Greek language and Greek custom and Greek culture to the East. And so you start to see elites cropping up in Egypt and in the Seleucid Empire and in Asia Minor, where the elites start to talk, uh, speak in Koine Greek, which becomes the language of the upper class, of the elites. Uh, it's mostly sp spoken in court systems, and it's also taught in education. It's not really in Mesopotamia. I'm going to leave Mesopotamia, Bactria and Socrates out of it so much, because there's less information on that, those areas, so we don't know if it's as solidified in the others. But it's evident in like colonies like Alexandria, uh, Alexander Alexander on the Euphrates, I believe it is, or the Tigris, sorry if I've got it um, slightly wrong. But you start to see that these hubs of influence uh, of Greek culture start to spread out. So you see Jerusalem uh, under Antiochus IV starts to get a gymnasium, a very Greek-style uh, building. You start to see this Greek culture climbing through the ranks as such, um, and becoming important in amongst the elite and the wealthy. Alongside the Greek language, Alexander also starts to change culture itself. Um, you start to see uh, the Greeks being incorporated uh, in dress, in style, in food, into other areas. You even have new cultures being established, like the Indo-Greeks, the Indo-Persians, uh, sorry, the Greek, per the Greek Greco-Persians. You have cultures that have literally clashed uh, they are so opposed to each other but they found little holes and cracks and they've morphed themselves into it and they've 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 changed your alexander has brought literally has brought the west to the east and they've met in the middle and they've started to create new systems and new um cultures and ways and customs uh, and that doesn't change and that really does get solidified throughout this hedonistic period and is well well established by the time of around about 100 BC 200 BC these are cultures that are here to stay it seems however I'm not saying that other cultures just disappeared like the Persian culture the Egyptian culture they are very much still apparent and in some areas they are still used predominantly but they are coexisting alongside these other cultures that have merged so if let's say we are in mesopotamia you may have a greco-persian culture in some areas but then other different classes so like the lower class and such they may still take up the persian dress they may not take on the egyptian culture the hellenistic time period becomes insanely multicultural it is a cosmopolitan society where different cultures are there you may have some people who are uh, Greco-Indians. You may have some people who are kind of have that Bactrian style, that have that Sogdian style. I'm not saying that they got rid of the others and they got absorbed. I'm just saying other cultures began and they coexisted. So back to our question then. Alexander, was he great? I like to argue that, yes, he was great. Um... No one can take away the military achievements he'd done. He was one of a kind. 
there are only few people in history that have managed to achieve the likes that he did. Um, and you do not see that for a few hundred years until another one crops up. I'd say the next one that crops up, you could argue, could be Hannibal. Um, then probably Julius Caesar. You have these figureheads that do come. But, but Alexander is by far probably level with the best. And maybe even sneaking past some of the ones that I've said. He, he is an amazing military tactician. And that has to be credited. He is, I believe, he deserves the title The Great. However, I do not think it is as solidified as others believe. I think he was a failure when it came to the political infrastructure and establishing a method where he can secure his empire. For instance, the Romans do it in a very, very good way. Um, I'm going to talk about the Romans on another podcast, uh, but... You see examples like the Romans, they managed to conquer large places of the world and keep it for a very long time. Alexander failed to do that, and that is Alexander's failings. I, re- I believe if he did not have the battle of Granicus, Issus, and Gorgamella, he would not be the great. I think he would be like Philip II, recognised in history, but lost in its pages. He would not have been in the outstanding figure that he was. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the AIQ podcast. Um, I'm hope- uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Uh, at the end of this podcast, there'll be a list of reading uh, if you want to do any further stuff. And we're also going to be crediting the ancient sources in, in the new year where we have got many other podcasts lined up. So be sure to pop back when you can. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this podcast, we would really recommend you go and read Alexander the Great by Robin Lane Fox. It describes his campaigns in a lot of detail and it gives his input on certain events that I think you'd find very interesting. Um, once you've read him, there are other books you can go out and and find for yourself, but I think that's a really good basis. The ancient sources uh, that we use today include Plutarch, The Life of Alexander, it's quite an interesting read, and then there's two books by an author called Arian. One is the Anabasis, which follows his Alexander's campaigns, and the other one is Arian, and it's called the Indica. And this is looking more at the Indian side. Again, thank you very much for listening. Have a wonderful day.